do that. All right. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our free we uh, May webinar um, featuring Dr. Ralph Steele and I'll let Ralph tell more about himself in just a moment. But before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about the online peer mediation platform for those of you that are just joining um, or those of you that will be watching by video. And we actually have some of our team members on tonight, so um, you'll see their names in the slides that I'm going to show in just a moment. So let me share my screen. Oop, let me make sure I share the right thing here. So here we go. So um, Ralph, what do you see? Do you see a PowerPoint? Yeah, I see the uh, online peer mediation platform. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, we are a group of educators um, and uh, professionals from many organizations. Um, and here is a list of our team members. I won't um, go over everyone tonight, but I will point out two of our team members that are on tonight. Kyle Bruner, who is the past, past president of the Georgia Association for Conflict Resolution and registered mediator. He's also owner of Bruner Mediation. And then, of course, Anding Gross, who is author and nationally certified school psychologist from Champaign, Illinois, and she is going to be doing a webinar in August, and then Kyle's going to be doing a webinar um, at some point as well. So um, all of our team members really have a lot of knowledge to share, and so I'll, I'll, I would be remiss if I did not introduce these two wonderful people who are with us tonight. Um, a little bit about OPMP. We were initially funded by the James Foundation in 2014. Uh, we were grant funded. Um, we were also managed by the Association for Conflict Resolution. And then in 2016, we were taken over by the National Association of Peer Program Professionals, uh, which is a nonprofit organization. And so we have four goals of our platform, uh, providing people with free resources. We believe in free. I think Andine said it. Yeah. Uh, best uh, earlier when she said we just like to share ideas and that's part of what our platform is is sharing ideas that's why we provide these free webinars and we have lots of free resources um, and if you know of resources that we should share we'd love to we'd love to share on our website um, so here's just some of the things that we have as far as our resources the links best practices research are the peer mediation standards. I don't know for those of you that are joining tonight that there are standards for peer mediation. Um, we have curriculum that we share and of course we have lots of media. We also provide online training and basic peer mediation skills for students. Um, we will help your schools if you're interested learn these basic peer mediation skills as either part of your mediation training or um, if that's something you want us to do. So we do have this online training we do provide. Um, we also have online peer mediation skills development. If you already have a peer mediation program and you just want your students to practice, we have students here in the United States that might want to practice with students in other countries. So we do provide that as well. Um, so again, we, we teach our, your students how to practice their skills by participating in online simulations and you get to keep those simulations as part of, you know, that practice. Um, we, I'm not going to go over it, but we do on our, our website have a one minute video that kind of shows you what the simulation looks like just if you want a quick and dirty look at it. But we have other simulations as well that you can look at. Um, so let me move on. We also, this is our dream, is to provide online peer mediation services for schools that don't have peer mediation. A lot of schools are kind of hesitant about that right now, but we're hoping that we're ahead of the curve and that maybe you know, eventually that people will really kind of take to that, especially schools. Um, and then, you know, we're, we are all about student safety. I know that's a lot of, of the concern with schools is that, hey, you're using this online platform, are students safe? And yes, they are. We actually provide, um, we have no contact with the students. Um, this, all the activities are carried out in the school under the direct supervision of the peer mediation coordinator. Um, so we are looking for partners, schools out there, if you're interested. Uh, we're looking for qualified trainers and mediation centers um, who are experienced in mediation um, to maybe join us. And this is what that looks like. So we have the own, uh, online peer mediation platform, the mediation trainer and the schools. We will provide training and online mediation to the peer mediation trainers. And then you will apply that online to your school. And then you will, the schools will give you feedback 
and then we will take those case studies and lessons learned to create best practices. And this will be great free resources again for the uh, peer mediation community, which is what we're all about. We also have other services that we have recently added. And I just want to just share those very briefly. Uh, we do provide peer mediation coordinator training online. It's a 32 hour intensive training that you will receive a certificate from the Association for Conflict Resolution. Um, so we've been blessed with that. Um, we do provide organizational conflict resolution training to organizations. Um, and so we know that's a big thing. Uh, conflict in organizations costs a lot of money. So we do provide uh, that training. Uh, Ondine provides teacher-student mediation for schools. So if you're interested in that, Ondine is our specialist in, in that. And then one other uh, that is coming soon would be mediator mentor training for college students who are interested in mediating and providing practice for high school and middle school students. So that's a little bit about us. And so if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. My name is Cynthia Morton, and you should have received an email from me about this uh, online um, webinar. So you can email me anytime. And then we will have uh, our next webinar will be in June. Um, it will be by career coach David Smith um, called Fostering Career Pathways in Conflict Resolution and Peace Building. And that will be June the 26th at 6 p.m. So. That's us. Here's our website if you want to go on our website and look. Okay, so Ralph, I'm turning it over to you, buddy. Uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Cynthia Martin, and all the rest of the persons who's uh, listening today. And uh, it's amazing. Um, I know David Smith. You showed him. I know David. He's out of New York. I've done some things with him before. Great guy. Uh, <clears throat> and just a little bit of before I actually start, I'll just kind of give a little bit of a thing about who I am. In 1992, I was actually in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, Birmingham had a city school system of about 55,000 students. And if you can imagine 55,000 students, you're going to have some kind of conflict. And so as a result of that, uh, in all honest and truth, I had no clue what mediation was. But so they asked me, I was hired to do some work and to try to help deal with the different issues of conflict that the system Birmingham had at that time. And so, you know, my, my beliefs is, and thinking is, you don't just jump into some a pot of hot water and burn. You, you do an assessment study, research feasibility, and you, and you look at carefully how you can uh, approach something in the most uh, impactful, professional way that you can, rather than just jumping in and making more mistakes than what happened. So I ended up writing a, um, did some research study and some, if you will, did some uh, surveys, and I came up with a program called SRIM. School Conflict Resolution and Mediation Program. So as a result of that, we actually train, kind of like what Dean is doing, we trained some teachers, some students, and we also took some of the students who were what people might call the troublemakers, and we included them in the process, and it, and it did work, work, and it came out to be a, a very uh, good program. And so that's how I initially got introduced into mediation uh, from a peer mediation process. And otherwise, I had no clue what the, even the word mediation was. And that was 1992. And here I am today, I mean, continuing to do some peer mediation stuff. And of course, I do a lot of mediation cases with, uh, on different panels around the United States. And, uh, teach mediation at the University of Texas Arlington and uh, do some other different things. I'm also an arbitrator as well. And I've written a couple, couple of books um, on mediation and, and um, what have you. So that's kind of my segue into uh, mediation and on occasion still do some peer mediation training um, with schools right here in the Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas area. Um, uh, where it's very, very hot today. So, <clears throat> so otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and get started. 
And um, as, as those who are looking and listening, and the title of the day that I began with is uh, Prevention Practices, uh, Restoring, Empowering Students Through Peer Mediation. And the reason why I, I put prevention is because I think that <clears throat> can give you an idea is that where, that's where we need to go more of in the prevention. And so moving along, as you can see, the outline is, you know, I'll come back and give a definition of that, but it's defined, restored to prevention practices. Uh, then, then I'll talk about the learning objectives, and then we'll go into assessment for individual school system, uh, citizenship as preventive, restorative practices, um, and uh, then we have uh, restorative discipline, um, Restore the discipline, um, um, and then then we have uh, what does it look like? What does restore the what does the process look like? Uh, and then then the peer mediation team, what is what it consists of? And then uh, each student adult receives a minimum of twenty hours. Uh, sometimes some system would do thirty, some would do forty. Uh, it just depends on your uh, what what school system you are at and, and uh, what they desire and uh, and then finally we will end up with a conclusion and and of course if those who might want questions you can stop me at any time I'm pretty uh, uh, easy going you can kind of uh, stop me and do questions at any time you like but now we're going to go back and, uh, and and kind of talk a little bit about uh, what is the restorative prevention practices? Well, the first thing is, is it is not guilt by association. It is maintaining the balance of educational policies and their daily actions. It is primarily a mode of preventing negative versus intervening. Uh, secondly, it is can effectively deal with severe negative behavior, but the goal is prevention. And because when, when students do Thing and, and their behaviors are negative, we have to do something about that. But if we can do some preventing thing, preventive things, I think that we will cover more ground, we'll be more effective, more in, impactful, and, and, and then above all, we can empower the students uh, to do things. <clears throat> the question is, can we really prevent many of the uh, do we wait for our innocent children to be, to be bullied to PTSD or gunned down like a slaughterhouse, like some of the things we had? We had one here in Houston, of course, and one in Florida and other places. Uh, so I propose that through preventive practice, restoring and empowering students to, through peer mediation, we can prevent many problems and restore others to calm, peace, uh, and citizenship in our American schools and communities. And I believe we can do that. Um, restore the practices is, is inspired by the, the values and principles of restorative and preventive practices, a worldwide socioeconomic movement to institutionalize peaceful approaches uh, to both uh, present negative behaviors, prevent negative behavior, and address negative behavior, solve severe problems, and uphold human rights for everyone. If there is a greater focus on prevention, I think perhaps less focus will be on restoring the harm because the first thing when you talk about restore the justice, uh, naturally people think about, well, wait a minute, what happened? What type of harm happened? So we have to restore or repair that injury and, re and as much as we can restore that person and hopefully the person will have some healing if that happens, if that can happen. Sometimes it can, sometimes it cannot. Um, the basis of restorative practice, from my perspective, is that it is a no-fault process. Uh, no-fault process. It seems when there is a no-fault process, it allows students to be themselves without uh, stereotypical judgment. Uh, the premise of no-fault does not mean and peer mediation that we exclude responsibility and accountability. 
I was once teaching a mediation course at the University of Texas Arlington, and I had a police officer in my course. And when I used the term no foul, the police officer it was could not even grasp the uh, perspective at all. And so I had to explain how there's a difference between no fault and responsibility and accountability. We hold all students and adults responsible and accountable. There's no way around that. And so in that context, the no fault, this process from my perspective is no fault. And that gives uh, students a whole uh, a wonderful way of looking at and, and, and when you're talking about being empowered, it would really, really empower students because now there's no finger pointing, there's no blame. But now, okay, if they did something, though, they still have to be accountable for it. And so that's, that, that's where I'm at in terms of the prevention uh, category. Now, kind of, we're going to go over the learning objective. The learning objective today is assessment for pure mediation. So, and I'll come back and kind of give a, a deeper, uh, more deeper explanation of what that is. The no fault premise for peer mediation, because you have to look at it from a no fault perspective. Um, define what is restorative practice in peer mediation. An explanation of citizenship as systems thinking theory in peer mediation. And then finally, identify the restorative practice of peer mediation. And those are the learning objectives today. Uh, you know, I mean, for those who are listening, and of course, if you have any questions, just, just you know, key into your, I'm not IT. Um, you know, I'm, I went to law school, so ask me something about law or uh, psychology, I can help you. But ask me something about IT, I can't help you. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is, is kind of go into um, assessment. What do we look for when we do assessment, when you're looking for assessment for kids? Because I think that is a clue into how we can better uh, make peer mediation and restorative prevention practices uh, effective. What do we look for? Well, one of the things we look for uh, is, is with a question, where is the where's where the focus is to resolve a conflict disagreement or understanding between the teacher and student uh, number two uh, is the focus between student and student uh, a dispute or some type of disagreement another thing we um, assess is where the focus is to address a student's misconduct which may have caused harm or had an adverse impact um, <clears throat> on others, other students, but where no individual has been directly or seriously harmed. Um, another uh, um, assessment question is where the focus is to initiate a process that will help to resolve a conflict, disagreement or understanding between the student and other parties. And it could either also be a, a particular group in a school, uh, could even be a game for that matter. Uh, and then another uh, focus for assessment could be where the focus is to initiate a process that will help to address the harm that the student has caused to another person, another student, or perhaps another teacher. Um, and then another one, uh, assessment is, is simply this here, and this is the most oxymoron one. Is how can we assess a school and a peer mediation program to just simply help students model what I call good American citizenship behavior, model it as a preventive process. And I'm not saying that we don't have that in some schools because certainly we do, but perhaps we can increase the number of students doing that 
And I think there we have a, a potential for prevention because my position on this is if we can say, okay, of the mediation program on a peer level, if we can say 50%, and I'm, I'm guesstimating here, 50% can be prevented and the other 50% can be where we actually deal with something that has happened. And I don't think people look at peer mediation or any kind of mediation in many ways as prevented rather than, well, reactive. Let's do something after something happened, a child behavior occurred. Let's do something after that. What I'm saying to you all today is let's be proactive. And this is not just a proactive thing, but this is a restorative preventing mediation for peers, you know, at a school system that we can prevent some things rather than waiting for things to happen. And that's the way I think, and I think that's part of systems theory is because if, if, if some of the children or have, ish, have issues at a school system from a psychological, emotional, or whatever, even academic uh, perspective, then now if we're doing some assessment with that, because, I mean, we can even assess, you know, in kids who have psychological, emotional problems, and then try to be ahead of that. And sometimes some of the kids that we may not have assessed because we, are, we assume that they come out of the great American family or in other countries, the same difference, that they are the good kids, but yet sometimes they end up doing things that we may not ever expect to happen. So now we can do those assessments and we can perhaps reduce and some of the percentage of behaviors that's occurring in our school systems. And I mean, that's the way I went to school back in a hundred years ago is, I mean, they were, they were on target with us. And of course that uh, brings me to the next section, which is citizenship. Uh, the, the oxymoron is, wait a minute, when I went to school and I hate to go back, but I'm going back today, uh, I was a member of a citizenship club. So what did we do? In the citizenship club, we were taught, they didn't call it mediation, peer mediation. They didn't call it conflict resolution. You know what I mean? With, uh, and I'm talking the broadness of what mediation is, but they didn't call it any of those names. But what happened was we actually was doing peer mediation a hundred years ago, nobody knew what it was. And as I reflected back over the years, wow, you know, I went to a Catholic school, I did go to public school, but I also went to a Catholic school and I discovered that the nuns were actually training us in peer mediation. They had another trainer too, that they don't allow today, they call it paddle, but they were training us in peer mediation back then and using a citizenship model for us to be good uh, American citizens and to be good students in school in order that we, our behaviors was less, particularly the negative behaviors. And so I propose that the, the issue of citizenship be used as one of the as part of the overall approach to those who are listening, you know I me mean, as as part of the peer mediation perspective. Because when you look at mediation from a broadly standpoint, anyway, mediation in itself is an interactive process that uses interdisciplinary uh, processes and interdisciplinary theories and uh, professionals, you know, I mean, professional, you know, I mean, like social, sociology, psychology, education, communication, legal aspects, com communication. It uses all of those approaches. So I'm saying now we can use citizenship. What does it mean? What criteria do we have and can 
young people use in order to be good citizens, in order that our schools are safe and that we can create safe zones in our schools and do it from a preventive process. Yes, we have to do things, and yes, no school is going to be perfect, and yes, no school will have perfect, you know, I mean, students. We know this, but can we do? Can we take a leap of faith, a quantum leap, and do better? I think we can, and I think we can do this worldwide, globally, in Georgia, in Texas. I'm I'm here in Big Dallas, Texas, and we can do it here, and we can do it everywhere. Um, so that's that's the thing. Now, when you look at the citizenship, of course, you have to have model training, uh, develop a model training approach. And if if um, and I don't have time to go into that complete thing today, but if you if you email me or uh, go through uh, Dr. Cynthia Martin, I can get you a model training of what citizenship looks like in a restorative peer mediation process, you know, because it has the training, has the goal, and then it's also a student teacher or counselor collaboration because you want it to be that is not just is not just from the top, is it's a balance of involvement from st both student and teacher. Um, so the next thing we'll do is go into uh, restorative discipline. Restorative discipline. Now, restorative discipline, excuse me, is the B part. Um, the citizenship is the A part. Restorative discipline is the B part. That's the part where the no fault comes in at. Because when students do things, I mean, my philosophy is people, when anybody does something wrong, they really know it. So the, the first perspective of discipline is to use the no-fault process and look at what happened and sitting down with students and now figuring out how do you restore the harm or the injury or the negative behavior that has occurred in order that uh, we can have restorative practices in a school system Hopefully they're not severe. Hopefully they're, uh, if they're major, you can, we can still deal with them. Uh, and if they're minor, it's easier to deal with. You know, I mean, a minor negative problem versus a major uh, problem, negative problem, uh, and we can deal with that. So now, what does that look like? What does it look like, number six? For me, what that looks like is the students, of being heard. I mean, I was reading an article the other day, and uh, and I kind of read a lot of the articles when a lot of these schools have these serial killings and what have you. And it's not just that, but I'm, I'm, I read some more articles, and it was said one of the primary reasons that some of the students are committing some of the gun violent crimes in the school system, but not just that. But in general, some of the, what I call the major severe negative behaviors is because those students may or may not have been heard. And, you know, they may have been on suspension or expulsion or expelled for some time, or they might be in, in, in school suspension. But, so what I propose is this, if, if through the peer mediation program, uh, we can develop what I call the circling process, which I'm sure that some of the social workers, counselors, and psychologists do from time to time, is in that circling process, if nothing else, we can ensure that students are being heard. And one of the, one of the goals of any form of mediation is, is that when people come to mediation, they have to be heard. The mediator ensures that the person is being heard. And so that's the same process that we can do uh, for the students. The B part is now that the students are being heard, they are also allowed in a very confidential 
perspective, and, and all mediation needs to be confidential, I mean, as far as we can do based on the legalities of the law, but they are able to express their specific issues. And when they're able to express their specific issues, now the mediator or the mediators, whether they be both the peer and if there's an adult involved in it, doesn't necessarily will try to address that issue directly, but at least have a way of referring that student to a school psychologist, to a school social worker or a counselor or wherever, whatever need there may be that that student can get help and not fall through the cracks and end up either being hurt, being bullied or shoot or hurt somebody else or their grades fall or they become, isol they isolate themselves or whatever situation, you know what I mean, that happens. The C part is, is looking to get some form of resolution. And, and when we do this in the peer mediation, we allow, of course, in all of the peer, the whole nature of peer mediation is, is that the students are so involved that they're also involved in the resolution process and the agreement and, and what will happen, what will take place and the scheduling, you name it. And so as a result of that, now the students can help bring resolution to the process. And it's not just, you know, those of us who are adults telling them what to do. And I think now in this resolution process, in essence, what it really does it empowers students. This is where, when we allow students to be a part of the resolution process, this is where in the title that you have today, not only do we provide the restoring, but we also are allowing the student to be empowered because now they can make some decision that already preset the decision of you know, I mean, approved by the school district, the school system, the superintendent, you name it, they're confidential, you know, they won't be, you know, I mean, there's no blame or anything like that. So again, going back, it's a no fault process. And I think in that context, the students end up doing a great job. Um, and there's a school system here, I won't name the school system in Dallas area, and I've been a part of that school system and I was able to see the students in the resolution process. And in that resolution process of being, bringing the restoration and, and the um, empowerment, but also it does D, which is potential healing. As we know, a mediation process is not a counseling session. The aim of it is not directly to bring healing, but what I can tell you, you, uh, those who are listening is that when this process unfolds and then it, and now you have a very collaborative process here, healing can happen. Is that the goal? No, but I mean, it's like my grandmother used to say, if you eat your vegetables, I'll give you some ice cream. So we take all of the good things um, that come with, you know I mean, what we do, and, and that way we are maintaining the standards that exist as because um, any form of mediation has standards. And so we have to maintain those standards and, and uh, there's nothing wrong at all with seeing, and I'm sure some of you who have already worked in the peer and other forms of mediation, you're seeing people heal from that process. Uh, and of course that's not our goal, but we take it. Uh, <clears throat> Now I'm going to uh, the next section, which is the uh, peer mediation team. What does a peer mediation team look like? My proposal, and every, of, of course, every school will have to determine that themselves. But I propose that the peer mediation team definitely be at least 50% students. You know, I know some from a diverse cross section as much as possible. I see some schools, you know, may have a little bit more adults 
You know, I mean, my, I mean, I think there needs to be adult supervision, obviously, but I think that we have to have a lot of the students involved and, of course, you know, student leaders. But it, when I first started peer mediation, I even had students who were involved in what I call major negative behaviors and actually put them in a leadership position and then very slowly saw changes in and how they did things differently. Um, and then number three is each student adult received, as we talked about earlier, a minimum of 20 hours of peer mediation training. It can be 30, it can be 40, uh, whatever uh, the, where you are in your peer mediation program, how y'all decide the type of training and who's gonna do the training for the students, uh, adults as well. Because what I've discovered is, which I'm sure all of you would agree, when you do the excellent training, there's a greater buy-in by the students into the effectiveness of the peer mediation process. Um, now, question. What can, number seven, what can restorative uh, preventive practice impact in school? Well, some people may not realize it, uh, it can assist in preventing gun violence. I really think it can, um, even though that's a severe process. Because um, if we can prevent a lot more of this gun violence and, and senseless killing of innocent students, then this, we're on to something here. Uh, a B, it, it also can impact truancy where students miss too many academic school days. And if you're not in class, you can't learn. So, um, and that's, that's, that's a critical issue as well. Uh, you don't hear it on the CNN or the news media, but it's a critical issue. And that's one of the things that we, uh, I've actually been involved in both the training and actually a mediator in the uh, truancy and peer mediation pro uh, program right here in, in the Dallas, Arlington, Texas area, and it really has been very, very effective. Uh, and then see, um, it can prevent and reduce bullying. And um, one of the uh, research studies uh, uh, articles I read was that a lot of the serial killings in school systems uh, direct result of bullying in the school system. And so when we, if you will, if we can provide uh, mediation to a lot of these students, uh, I think that we can prevent, you know what I mean, and if not prevent it, we can intervene through the mediation process and, and uh, stop the bullying, which a lot of the bullying leads to other things, uh, such as students getting gunned down, Feel hurt, uh, things that just shouldn't happen in an educational setting. We know they happen, but it should happen. Um, then, and then D is it can um, prevent and reduce what the severe negative behaviors. And the severe negative behaviors are that's when the actually fighting, fist fighting, the what we you'd call assault that goes on and and in that severe negative behavior, at some school, you have some uh, sexual assault uh, at, that, at the teenager student level that we can prevent as well, um, that should happen as well. Uh, so, and then two is we can prevent what, you, what is called the minor negative behavior. Uh, of course, the minor negative behaviors are easier to deal with. Um, but, you know, if we can reduce all of these things using the peer mediation process on the prevention side and also the actual, when things happen, wow, I mean, we can, we can, we can do that. And then, and then E is what is called the, uh, I think using the citizenship perspective in the context of peer mediation from a prevention perspective, we can model, we can actually have schools to start modeling good behaviors. And of course, 
I'm not indicting any schools saying that we don't have some students already modeling, but we can, we certainly cannot, it won't hurt to have more. And so as we do that and have more modeling of good behaviors as a source of prevention and citizenship in the school system, but also in the community, I think that we're on to something. I think the effectiveness, the impact that can happen more would be just great. And, and, and particularly for those of you who are professionals, psychologists, social workers, teachers, counselors, and administrators in the school system, how wonderful it would be you go to school and you don't have to be concerned about not one child, you know what I mean, being bullied or beat up or being gunned down in America. And that's, that's what I, the day that I still have nostalgia for. And as long as I breathe, I'm going to shoot for that. And uh, that's where I'm at. And uh, that's my... Uh, uh, perspective today is in in um, in conclusion. Um, <clears throat> in conclusion, what I'd like to say is um, <clears throat> uh, we want to use the restorative prevention practices to create caring climates to support more healthy school systems. We want to use the restorative uh, prevention practices. Where the, so there is understanding and the harm that when it does happen, if it does happen, we hope it don't, that there's a development of empathy for both the harm and the, and the uh, those who did the harm. We want to use the, the practice as a way of listening and responding to the needs of the persons uh, who would potentially do the harm but because we're listening to them, we might be the one person using a peer mediation citizenship model to stop that person, that student, from doing something that he or she ought not to do. And then we use this process as an encouraging accountability and responsibility through personal reflection within a collaborative environment. The circling process, having students sitting in a circling, big, huge circle with a supervisor of the peer mediation process and peer mediators in that process, that in itself can encourage responsibility and accountability for students. And then the reintegrating the harmer into the schools because some students get suspended in some cases or in school suspension, but, and they encounter shame and guilt. And so how do we help that student re-enter uh, the school or their classmates or their friends or the other student um, and know that that student is valuable and uh, is a contributing member of the school system and society? And, uh, and so they feel good about themselves. Uh, and then most importantly, that we continue to be a part of what I call the change system, where we help uh, facilitate support and change policy that advocate uh, peer mediation systems, not only in, across America, but in the whole world, because ultimately I think that uh, the mediation process is an outstanding, excellent system, whereas that we can do more to have better schools because, I mean, what will any of us be who are educated without the education system? And the school system is the one place where students spend an enormous amount of time in their daily life outside of home from their parents and other institutions they're a part of. And so, I think that we have a golden opportunity here to prevent, reduce, and uh, deal with certain behaviors, but more importantly, to continue to teach students how to cope with behaviors outside of violence and, and deal with disputes in a more um, calm, just, and an appropriate manner so we have better schools. And uh, that's 
my presentation for today. Uh, I will pause and uh, wait for questions and uh, uh, comments and uh, go from there. Thank you so much, Ralph. And so you have two ways you can respond. You can either unmute yourself or there is a chat function at the bottom of your computer, I hope, um, and you can send a chat and I will uh, ask Ralph the question. But um, before we get started on the questions, Ralph, I think this is a great way to look at peer mediation as more of a uh, prevention and restorative piece and a great way to advertise that to your school, especially schools that are hesitant about uh, instituting peer mediation programs, especially the old type of peer mediation programs back in the day, you know? So thank you so much for giving us a new perspective about peer mediation. You're welcome. So at this time we'll open up for questions. Okay, we have one question. Um, uh, let me make sure I gather all of it. It says, thank you for your clear explanation. I am a mediator in Brazil and work in a law tech that does online mediations. I was looking for information on different approaches on the subject. I studied school mediation in Argentina with mediators from the Ministry of Education. Here in Brazil, the medi mediation is just starting. So I think this person is really looking for um, additional resources. So um, do you think, Ralph, that you might could provide some resources for this person or should this person maybe reach out to you and you provide them because you have copious uh, knowledge of the law? Yeah, I can do either both. Uh, <clears throat> I can send uh, uh, the person some information by either email, probably by email. Uh, if they like, I have no problem doing that. Uh, if, uh, if they would email me, I can send them uh, some of the information today and any other information because I have some more information. In other words, I can basically send them a packet of information and, and then they can use it according to uh, how they're needed in their schools, in their system. Okay, and Ralph, what I'll do is I will text that person your email if, that, if you're okay with that. I'm okay with that. Awesome. I won't charge you anything. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. That's very nice of you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have a question for Ralph or even a comment? One question. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead, Kyle. Oh, okay. Um, hey, Ralph, it sounds like you were uh, interested in actually uh, having a school culture change, which I think is a great idea. Uh, my question is, in introducing these programs, how long before you noticed the actual culture change in, in, in these environments that you introduced? Actually, uh, <laughs> actually, very good question, Kyle. Actually, I've noticed it actually within a six months to a year process because uh, what happens is a lot of the students, believe it or not, that's what they desire. They actually desire, you know what I mean, it's, it's almost like having a child in your home. Let's say you have a child and you don't provide them with structure and boundaries. So now these students are actually, once, once this is consistent, I, there, it's, there's a change. It has to be a consistency, though. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's just something you do one time and throw it away, cast it away, it doesn't work. It's with that level of consistency in, the, in six months or more, sometime more, you'll see it. I've seen change. Great, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Kyle. Do we have anybody? We had another person, I thought. Oh, I can ask a question if... Uh... Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Steele, um, for your work. I, I really sense the power of the transformation that occurs when you get your work into a school. And I, I know from my work as a teenagers, you know, they, they are looking for avenues to be heard and it is healing and it's just so, so important. Um, and so I, I really support all your work and everything that you described. Um, I was interested in your discussion of the no fault kind of uh, approach, which I hadn't heard that before with this work, but it makes so much sense because, 
you know, divorce is now no fault. And today I was talking to an insurance agent talking about whose fault is it? And, and a different apartment drips water in my apartment. He said, oh, well, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. <laughs> your insurance <laughs> cover it. You know, your insurance covers it, even if it's from their apartment. So, so that's such a concept now in our society about no fault. But but it's really a good way to get people in the door when they're talking about conflict because they know that it's not going to be a blame game. And exactly. I think that's really smart. Well, what happens is, thank you for your comments, uh, on me. What I've discovered is, is I used to do mediation and I would just start the mediation process with both peer and adult. And I noticed that when I just started off, everybody looking around and they're like, wow, well, wonder who's at fault today. Mm. So now we started off even with the, the students and when they hear that there's no fault. Now what happens, what I've discovered is they buy into the process. Yes. Greater. There's a greater buy. I mean, because now it's not, you, we're not finger pointing them and blaming them. And, and throwing guilt on them. And see, kids encounter guilt just like adults do. So when you when you come in with the no fault process and you and, and you express it so succinctly and they understand you, and once you know that they understand it, now they buy into it. Yeah. They they're gonna work with you because what the no fault process does with students. It tells them also that you, and when I say you, I'm talking about all of us, mm -hmm. all of us as adults, we really care about them. Mm -hmm. And what I think a lot of times students don't respond to us is not because we're not great professionals, that we're not properly trained, or we don't, we're not upholding the standards. It's because they, the students don't think we care about them. And you've heard the old adage, Nobody wants you to help them until they know that you want care. Right. And so I, I found the no fault process to be extremely, I mean, I can't, I'm glad you, you, uh, you focus on it because I can't, I can't underestimate the power of that no fault perspective. And even, even when I've had, you know how you do caucuses sometimes, mm -hmm. you, you put people in a caucus, and they might, you can sense the pressure. And then you kind of say, well, you know what? Uh, before we get started, let me remind you that this, and whether it's been an adult or student, I want to remind you that this is a no fault process. Mm -hmm. And once you say that in a caucus or even in a joint session, now you got a whole, the, the mental perspective changes, mm -hmm. the psychological and the emotional dynamics change and there and and there's a there's an eagerness then versus before it's like you stay over there and i'm over here but now it's a team approach mm -hmm. good stuff thank you you're welcome any other questions for ralph ralph you did such a good job everybody has no questions <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Ralph, do you have any parting comments of knowledge that you might give anyone that start maybe interested in starting a peer mediation um, program? I think we had some people that said they didn't really have one, but they were really interested. What would be a good starting point for anybody interested at this point? I think a good starting point <coughs> is uh, sometimes some school systems are not adapt to receiving new programs. We, we all know this here. So, so now here's how we get around that, particularly in schools that are uh, people who are so caught up in the bureaucracy and I'm not judging nobody, but some, what I've discovered is if you, the law, the, the, the title, the, the education school system law permits students to start different groups. And so one of the starting points that I think is, is to start a peer mediation program as a student group that starts it. And now once the student group starts it, you have to have a 
faculty, staff, you know what I mean, adult supervisor, a sponsor to have it going. That's how I started one at a school that the principal did not want it. But but the way I got around it was I said, look, well the students want it. Oh he could and so he said, well yeah we, the students can have it. But if I, I wanted to start it, it's like no you can't start it because we gotta pay you. But the the, the principal was, was thinking, wait a minute, you got to pay me extra. No, I don't want money. I just want the students to have have it. So now it was able to, it was, it was afforded an opportunity for the students to start it and now and then grow it from there. Build, build it from there with the training and everything. That's, that's my uh, suggestion to those who don't want to deal with the bureaucracy in schools because you don't want to fight that that elephant at all. That's not a I don't fight the, I don't fight no system because it's it's too big. But if you if you find an easier approach to do it and now you build on it from the student's perspective with an adult sponsor, you can make a, a peer mediation program. Very good. Oh, that was a great nugget. Uh, Ralph, thank you so much. Um, so before we end for tonight, um, I want to thank Dr. Steele so much for imparting his knowledge and just giving of his time. Um, thank you, Ralph, so much. We really appreciate that. And I would like to thank all of you who are on tonight and those that cannot be on tonight. Um, we are providing a copy of this video. So please feel free to share this video with anyone. Uh, we do provide monthly webinars each month. Our next one, again, is June 26th. Um, and we will have that information on our blog, which is on our website which is puremediationonline.org. Um, if you're interested in finding out more information about peer mediation training, please reach out to us. I think we can help you. If we can't help you, we can provide someone maybe that can help you. And um, we just want to thank you for your time. So um, as we end tonight, anybody have any uh, comments they would like to share or just uh, information that you got from tonight's uh, webinar that you thought was powerful? And that's how we'll end tonight. Uh, I love what you said, Ralph, at the end about kids, you know, starting their own um, peer mediation organization because you do have to have a sponsor for that. That was pretty powerful for me. Thank you. Yeah, that's been the most helpful thing for me because sometimes um, the, the teachers, counselors, or the faculty staff may not be allowed but the students have that right. Awesome. And that's been the best approach. And once, and because if they start it and they like it and they buy into it, it's on. <laughs> it's on then. And now we we will save some of these kids from being hurt. And that's what's important for me is creating a safe zone for these kids. And, and for me, that's a that's for me, peer mediation is a form vice versa of citizenship we are citizens of america and of the world that's where i'm coming from and you can't truly be a citizen unless you're peaceful and that's and that's my that's my two cents of joy and hope and peace for everyone again i thank you dr martin and uh kyle and uh, dean and everybody that's listening have a great uh rest of the oh. evening Ralph, we have one. We had one person. Lillian, did you have um, you raise your hand? I did. I had a question as to yeah. what's the difference between the peer mediation and the and conflict resolution. Mm. Okay. Great question. <laughs> okay, the difference between conflict resolution uh, is everybody actually uses conflict resolution every day, whether they realize it or not. Now, the, now here's peer mediation. Peer mediation is a systematic process that has standards and has and is part of a legal process in some ways. And and whereas conflict resolution, anybody can do it. There's no process to it. You can do anything to do it. There's no standards to it at all. Whereas peer mediation is a systematic process that's clearly defined using communication, uh, you know what I mean, some of the legal issues, using psychology, sociology, 
uh, you name it, you know what I mean, using that process. And, you know, I, I call the, uh, there's a guy named Douglas Noel. He wrote an article called the, uh, and some of you may have read it before, Douglas Noel, he wrote an article called The Theory of Mediation. And in that theory, he uses a four-letter word called CRIP. Um, CRIP. And uh, basically, the, the C-R-I-P. C is content. Uh, R, R is relationship. I is identity. And P is process. And so that's why the, the, the mediation process is a process that's systematic and conflict resolution is not. But they, um, but they both have some impact and they both work and, and, and they both are legitimate. And uh, that's, uh, I, even though I think peer mediation is far more effective. Okay. Awesome. Thank can you. Can you see them working together? Can it be conflict resolution? Because even though we do conflict resolution every day, we're not, we don't know it and we're not as tolerant of other people's differences. So could they be fused together? Can you see some of the principles of conflict resolution being introduced? Oh, absolutely. The fact is in peer mediation, in any form of mediation, some of the principles of conflict resolution are certainly uh, overlap into each other. There's no doubt about that at all, because in the first, in order to really understand mediation, you have to understand, con to really understand mediation, you really have to understand conflict resolution anyway, and what is a conflict, and then how is it resolved? Thank you. You know, that, that I mean, that, that's a, so that's, that's kind of how I look at it, you know what I mean? So yeah, they interact no doubt at all. Awesome. Thank you, Lillian, for asking. And, and so, Karina, I noticed you just came on. I'm sorry we were 6 uh, p.m. Eastern time, but the good news is I recorded this webinar and you'll get a copy of it. So don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Karina, for being on. So, um, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and finish up. Thank you so much. Again, Dr. Still, thank you and everyone for being on, and everybody will get a copy of this webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. Okay. Y'all, everyone, have a great evening. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.